Okay, so now the next question I had um, was how much of the decrease in, in, in milk yield is due to simply the decrease in feed intake? Obviously, animals re reduce their feed intake during heat stress. All animals do. Chickens, pigs, beef, dairy, doesn't matter. And of course, they produce less. And forever, the dogma was that they simply produce less because they consume less feed. Right? Darwin wrote about this. Animals produce less during the summertime because they ate less. So this, this is a 300-year-old, or how old is Darwin? I don't know. Anyway, he's old, right? He's no spring chicken. So we, to get at this, we looked at, um, we wanted to, to, do, to set up the experiments where we had a, a group of cows in thermonutrient conditions, but we restricted their feed intake. And I'll explain this in a second. We took multiparous cows. This was at the University of Arizona. We had a 10,000 cow dairy right next to us, so we, we could go grab just multiparous cows at a short window of, uh, of lactation. We put them in thermonutrient conditions, then we put them in heat stress. And the body temperature was about 105 degrees. This is feed intake on the y-axis. Again, I apologize, this is a metric system, but it's in kilos, so multiply it by 2.2. And of course, well, to the left of the vertical dashed line is thermonutrient conditions. To the right of the vertical dashed line is cyclical heat stress. And animals got hot, they ate less. No big deal here, right? What I want you to take note is on that fourth week of the experiment, so the third week of, the, uh, of heat stress, they started to eat more. So feed intake was starting to acclimate to heat stress. Right? So feed intake was acclimating. This is milk yield. Milk yield, uh, of course, goes down during heat stress. So they're producing, I don't know, about uh, 35, uh, 85 pounds of milk. Heat stress hits them. There's a rapid decrease in milk yield. But unlike the feed intake, where there is an increase in, in milk yield or feed intake in the fourth week, there's no increase in milk yield on the fourth week. Let me back that up. There's an increase in feed intake on the fourth week occurring right here, but no increase in milk yield. So that was our first hint that something's not kosher here, right? There should be an increase in milk yield here. If, if the dogma is true, that simply production simply follows feed intake. Blood non certified fatty acids are what the vet looks at if, you're, if they're interested in ketosis and the nutritionist. Blood nephus should go up. If an animal loses 100 pounds of body weight in a week, which these cows did, blood nephus should go up. And they didn't. That was another thing that was really weird. I'll talk about nephus more here in a second. So some, th this is a very simple experiment. Some things that jumped out at us, though, is that there, maybe this dogma that feed intake and productivity really wasn't so, uh, uh, so, it wasn't so true. And I want, we were very interested in the metabolism <coughs> of heat stress. So we set up a, now a, a series of experiments where we have thermonutric cows coming in. Half the cows go into heat stress. You allow them to eat as much as they want. The other half of the cows, though, stay in thermoneutral conditions, 68 degrees Fahrenheit or something like that. But we only allow them to consume the same quantity of feed as the heat stress cows. So we have two groups of cows. One's heat stress, eating as much as they want. One's thermoneutral, but we only give them the same quantity of feed that the heat stress cows are consuming. So the only difference between these two groups of cows is one's hot and one is not. Feed intake's the same, though. Okay, that's key. So this is feed intake on the y-axis. Again, a kilogram. So they're eating about, oh, 45, almost 50 kilos or pounds of dry matter. Heat stress cows in red, and the pear-fed cows are in, in yellow. Remember, this group of cows is in thermoneutral conditions. This group of cows is in, 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 in hot conditions. Feed intake's the same. About a 30% reduction in feed intake. This is milk yield. This is where it started to get exciting for us. Of course, the, the pear-fed cows, the cows in thermoneutral conditions, they have a reduction in milk yield of about 10 pounds, just like you'd predict. The heat stress cows, though, they have a continued and marked and progressive decrease in milk yield for at least six days. So now we know that, remember, these two groups of cows are consuming the same quantity of feed. So all this difference in milk yield that you see here has nothing to do with the reduction in feed intake, but everything to do with just simply being hot. So what this means from a practical standpoint is, if your dairy is losing 10 pounds of milk during heat stress, five pounds of it's because she's not eating. The other five is something we don't know what it is. Well, hopefully by the end of the talk, we have a better idea what this is, okay? So half full, glass half full, get the cows to the bunk. That's still five pounds of milk, right? Get them cooled, get them to the bunk. The other, the other five pounds, we've got to figure out what's going on. 
So these cows lost body weight. In our experiments, these, these heat stress experiments last about 10 days, in between 7 and 10 days. And they'll lose 100 pounds of body weight in 10 days. Right? So they're rapidly losing body tissue. It's a very catabolic condition or a stressful condition. And both the, par the thermoneutral and the heat stress cows lose the same quantity of feed. Those cows should be mobilizing back fat, just like the transition cow. When you're worried about cows having ketosis, what you're worried about is having too high anifa levels in blood, non-esterified fatty acids. Well, the pair-fed cows in some conditions do that. They, they mobilize back fat. They're losing back fat, right? They're becoming uh, skin and bones. The heat stress cows don't mobilize back fat. They stay, they stay fat. They're losing 100 pounds. It's not coming from fat. What's it coming from? Muscle. The last tissue we want them mobilizing is muscle. Incidentally, we're all sitting here eating a high-carb lunch here. What's going on with our pancreas? Kaboom, right? It's kicking out insulin like crazy because we just all had a big lunch. We, likely we all had some ice cream before we came in. Right? That, those are all carbohydrates. And well-fed humans and animals have an increase in blood insulin. If you starved yourself, if you decided to skip lunch, your insulin levels go down. If you ate your lunch today and you had some carbohydrates, blood insulin levels would go up. Same thing with cows. So these cows' feed intake went down 30%. There should be reduction in blood insulin levels. But there's not. There's actually an increase in blood insulin. It's weird. That's in cows. This is in steers. Doesn't matter. I've done this in pigs. I've done it in rats. Heat stressed animals have an increase in blood insulin levels despite having a reduction in feed intake. It's awkward. It's weird. It, but I'll tell you why it's important and why it's costing you money. Okay. If you only knew how long it took me to make these slides. You'd appreciate why I spend so much time on What I like to compare that heat stress cow to the transition cow. A healthy transition cow that's losing body weight. Right? All healthy cows lose body weight after the calf. So she simply can't eat, she can't eat enough groceries. The groceries she eats, it gets fermented into propionate. That propionate is converted in the liver to glucose. But she's, uh, the, it, the pancreas is kind of... Uh, insensitive to that glucose, and so it doesn't secrete very much insulin. It's the lack of insulin, so low levels of insulin, that allows her to break down back fat. So she'll milk it off her back. Blood nephas go up. Nephas can be utilized by the muscle to make for energy. They can be utilized by the mammary gland to make milk fat, and they can be converted in the liver to ketones. This is normal. All cows do it. Some cows tip over the edge and they get ketosis. Anyway, this whole process, then, is a, is, a, is a strategy that she can burn nephas, she can burn ketones for energy, and she, can, and she can burn volatile fatty acids. Glucose is not needed as a fuel. She doesn't need to burn glucose, so now the mammary gland can get its glucose. The mammary gland gets glucose, and I'll tell you, I'm going to put it kind of in a simpleton's way, but my point is, glucose drives milk. The more milk, the more glucose the mammary gland takes up, the more milk she'll make. We want all the glucose going here, as much as we can get it, okay? And it's all because the pancreas doesn't secrete very much insulin. Heat stress. She also can't consume enough groceries. The groceries are converted in the liver to glucose, but the problem is the pancreas makes more, makes more insulin than what it should. The pancreas makes more insulin, and that prevents her from breaking down back fat. She won't milk it off her back, She'll pull it off her muscle. So now glucose, the increase in insulin has removed two fuels from her, so nephas and ketones. She has no options. Glucose now is going to be burned. There's a hierarchy during heat stress, right? Milk synthesis is in the low man on the totem pole. Survival now becomes high in the totem pole. Glucose, which would we want to go to the mammary gland, is going to be utilized by the muscle, the brain, the liver, other things other than the mammary gland. She remains in, uh, metabolically inflexible because of this insulin. 